Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Room for Discussion. My name is Pierre, and I will be your interviewer for today, together with Louis. Now, as a young economics student, the amount of information that we get from the economy can be quite overwhelming at times. And so every Tuesday, when I open up my FT app and I see Martin Wolf opening up at the top, I click on, I click on the piece, I stop with whatever I'm doing, and I read it at once. Now, our guest today, Martin Wolf, is senior economist at the Financial Times and has been for more than 20 years now. Before working at the FT, he was a senior economist at the World Bank and the director of studies at the Trade Research Policy Center. Um, now, the topic of today's discussion will be the importance of financial journalism in not only a post-truth, but also a post-crisis world. And what challenges has, will I, as an economics student, face in this world? Today, we'll be looking at two topics, the ascension of China and the economic consequences of climate change. As always, there's room for you, the audience, to ask questions. So when the moment is there, please raise your hand. And I think Gerard, where is he? Gerard here, no, Santiago will walk, with the, will walk with the microphone. For now, please give a warm round of applause to Martin Wolf. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Wolf. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> God. Uh, the, the, the couches are quite soggy, yes, let's put it that are. way. Um, now I want to start with, I have the Financial Times here, and this is um, today's edition. And, and you're in it uh, with the title, Forever in Depth, that dangers of deflation or inflation lead to the same outcome. Could you give us a short synopsis of, of, of the opinion piece of, of today? Uh, this is a particularly difficult one to summarize. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I'm surprised that they said that uh, they would lead to the same outcome. But uh, I never trust the sub-editors. You know, I, <laughs> I do the column. And somebody else usually puts on the headline, and they don't ask me. 95% um, of the time, it's better than what I would do, and 5% of the time, it's a disaster. And uh, <laughs> this is not a disaster, but it's in that sort of category. Um, so the, the basic, qu I've written two columns uh, really in response to readers uh, uh, who are asking, basically, how do we about how do we end up? Uh, how does the debt accumulation process in the Western world and to some extent the world as a whole of the last well, let's say 20 years? I won't go back through the last 60 years. How does it end? And uh, I addressed that in two columns. This was the second. The first column discussed how we got where we are, and the underlying argument is. There were a number of very large shifts in the world economy. China is a big one, but there are others. I couldn't mention them all, except in a paragraph, which shifted the balance between savings and investment, uh, leading to progressively lower real rates and progressively weaker demand in the developed world. This was addressed unsuccessfully, ultimately, with a huge credit boom. That's the way money, money and credit de demand is created out of nothing. Credit allows you to, tr to create demand out of nothing. If you've got institutions whose debt are accepted as money in particular, that's what a bank is. Um, so uh, that worked until about 2008, and then it blew up. <laughs> and that led to a re even more deficient demand. And the response to that was a combination in the short run of fiscal stimulus least in Europe, which is why the recovery was so terrible here, and, and enormously aggressive monetary policy, trying to keep the debt pyramid, as it were, upright, and to avoid a mass bankruptcy scenario of the type that happened in the 30s. It's then, uh, at the same time, there was some enormous credit expansion in the d emerging world, because the Western world's demand and weaken so much. And that's crucial in China, and I discussed that then. Now, coming to this week, I said, well, how do, might this end? Well, um, essentially, I said there are two extreme scenarios and a middle one. Uh, the middle one is what implicitly the world's central banks have been trying to engineer. The extreme ones are, one, that uh, the uh, in the effort to 
recreate demand through monetary processes. Uh, there's ultimately overshooting. Uh, this is most obvious and likely in the US now, where there's a huge fiscal boost, huge structural fiscal deficit, and continues to be pretty aggressive monetary policy in normal terms, and you suddenly find inflation is back. It hasn't happened yet, and it may never happen, but that will be one concern. If that happens, this, this would force for sure higher interest rates, and probably given the debt out there and the role of the dollar, a chain of bankruptcies, right. unpredictable. The other possibility is we have another crisis which is negative. Uh, a war, nothing looks more likely right now uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, a huge trade conflict leading to a massive decline in investment, a uh, panic in some markets, uh, very, uh, the central banks then have to respond to this. Well, central banks have essentially no room for maneuver, governments don't want to use fiscal policy, and so you then end up in a really big recession, threatening severe deflation. Remember, the underlying core inflation in the Eurozone is only 1% anyways. And once you get deflation, real rates start to rise, you can get again get a cascading wave of, uh, of bankruptcies, and then there's a question, what we'll do then? So you will have both ways are very disruptive and probably lead to a lot of defaults, but the inflation route at least gets rid of a lot of debt. The deflation route gives you debt deflation, having Fisher's famous debt deflation. And then finally, sorry, this is long, but it's yeah, a yeah. complicated question. <laughs> finally, there is this golden mean path where interest rates remain very low, inflation remains stable, uh, growth continues, there may be some revival of productivity growth. We manage the debt, it might even diminish a bit, some of it already has, at least it's stable, and we live in this environment sort of indefinitely. And uh, those are the options. Uh, and I believe that the latter option is possible, but difficult. And the other scenarios, particularly the deflationary shock scenario, is very plausible because of the complete breakdown of international cooperation, which is obvious. And, and that leads with the very final thought that if we had a deflationary recession of significant magnitude, the capacity of the world to cooperate in dealing with it, which is, did happen, however imperfectly, between 2008 and 2010, basically is now non-existent. Uh, cooperation would be more or less impossible. So I, the bottom line, I think, is that people should be pretty worried. Uh. <laughs> Great. I took a while, but that's <laughs> roughly where I got to. Now, you started working. Uh, I just want to take it back quickly, quickly through yourself, also to introduce you to our audience a bit. Um, you started working at the FT in, in 1987. Yes. Um, however, this, these are not the first pieces that we found of you in the FT. They were uh, letters and, and also um, 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 pieces. You really have done your research. Mm -hmm. oh, why did you? <laughs> Thank you. Why did you write these pieces before you started working at the FT? Well, that's why I ended up at the FT. So I, I thought I was going to be a moderately respectable development economist. That was my aim in mm. life. Uh, I was at Nuffield College at Oxford between 69 and 71, which at that stage was a real hothouse, so yeah. thinking about trade and development particularly. Uh, under the, um, particularly under the aegis of a very famous English economist, Ian Little, uh, and Jim Merlees, who became a Nobel Prize winner later. And so I was very inspired by development issues, and anyway, it seemed to me clear, I was a 25-year-old when I left, that uh, development was the great moral challenge for an economist, uh, uh, and that therefore I should work on this. I went to the World Bank, it was lucky enough to go there. I had 10 wonderful years from an educational point of view. I met some wonderful people who'd been lifelong friends and run lots of countries. Uh, um, so I knew most of the people who were very well who reformed India in the 90s, and I worked on India. But at the end, I concluded that the World Bank was a disaster. No. Okay. Uh, now, that's too simple. Lots of detailed things were, but I became very critical of, for many reasons, and I wrote about that in the preface to my book on globalization. So I decided I have to stop this. Anyway, I'm not a bureaucrat, I don't like this. So I go and do something else. So I joined, I didn't want to make, I've never had any interest in making money in the right. city. So I decided trade and development is important. 
globalization is a great potential for emerging countries, which sure has turned out to be true, and I would like to work on that. So I went to the Trade Policy Research Center, and we were then trying to promote the Uruguay round as a way of unifying the world trading system. Right. It seems sad now. And uh, that's why I wrote all these letters, because I was arguing for uh, the, the value of giving trade opportunities to developing countries particularly. Uh, um, uh, and we were very actively engaged in the intellectual background to the Uruguay Round on many fronts. Uh, one of the seminal works on trade and development, trade and developing countries in the GAD, was written because I commissioned it. Um, I wrote all these letters uh, because I like to be involved in the public debate, and then that led to the FT editor saying, would you like to come write as an opinion editor? I would like, to, before I conclude this, however, to go back to the beginning, which is why on earth did I become an economist? Right. Because I've never intended to be a technical economist. Uh, my background was rather unusual, and now inconceivable. I, I studied classics, classics exactly. so I, I was really good at Latin and Greek. Yeah. Uh, I, as I like to say, I'm probably the only economist, in, this is a generational yeah. thing, probably the only economist anyone knows who's read the whole of Homer in Greek. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so that's an achievement yeah. uh, of a sort. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, it's really rather good. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not the seminal work of Western literature by accident. Anyway, that's yeah. not the important. But, so, but I, the reason I switched from classics to PPE and then went to do the B MPhil in economics is I was very interested in politics. I've always been very interested in politics. I'm a child of the Second World War, literally. My parents were both refugees, uh, from the one from the Netherlands, one from Austria, Jewish. and. I re said, I'm really interested in politics. You really can't understand politics anymore without understanding economics. No. Uh, that's <laughs> essential. So I really must understand economics. So I'll see if I can do it without being a mathematician. And I sort of managed. And uh, that's the history. So I've always felt that if you're interested in economics, at least for me, it's not a, it's not a mathematical playground. I, it's, it's a policy subject. Right. In the aim of economics, if it's done properly, is to understand the world and try by understanding it to make it better, which we obviously don't always do. Um, but that's to me what economics has always been about, and I think it's the great tradition of economics. So that's how I ended up going to the World Bank and going to the TPRC and ending up at the FT. And I've been done it as an outsider, uh, in this role as a commentator, because in the end I discovered at the World Bank, though I was quite good at it, mm. I really didn't like being a bureaucrat. Yeah. And, 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 well, and there's nothing about being there a bureaucrat that you the didn't the like. I think the, the most important is reason is I came to realize that for me, mm. being able to express my own views to the world as honestly as I could, often wrong, of course, mm. uh, was the thing I most treasured. Uh, 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 you know, I think of it as, as the role of Cassandra in the world. Uh, Cassandra is a great figure in Greek, oh. uh, in the Homeric poems. Uh, the woman who was always right and never believed. Uh, so uh, that's sometimes what I feel like. And so, not always right, but... <laughs> right. Anyway, the point is, uh, I wanted my own voice. And you cannot work in a big bureaucracy and have your own voice. Right. You reflect the bureaucrat's, bureaucracy's voice. I think that would have been fine in a crisis situation, like a war, when you right. believe in what you're doing. And it would have been fine if I really, really thought the World Bank knew what it was doing. But I really didn't. <laughs> so, so the combination of being a cog in a very impressive machine with brilliant people, right. I mean, really, uh, remarkable people. I met some wonderful people. Uh, but uh, being a cog in a vast machine, it seemed to me to make a great many very, very serious mistakes mm. was very unattractive. And working in the British bureaucracy struck me as just ludicrous. <laughs> there, was a, uh, uh, there was a brief moment in the 70s when I thought quite seriously of going to the commission. Thank uh. God I didn't. Uh. How uh. come? <laughs> Why thank God you didn't go to the commission? Because I think it's a really problematic bureaucracy to work in as a bureaucrat. The, you know, I've always been a... Europhile in the sense of I believe in the EU. I also happen to be, it's probably no, always been a critic of the Euro. I think it was no. a mistake. I thought it took 30 years, so it's not a new idea. But I'm a passionately keen supporter of the EU. But I really don't think 
I would fit at all. I, I think working in the EU bureaucracy would drive me completely insane. Yeah. So I was very lucky not to do this, and I managed to find a place by chance. I didn't seek it. The, the editor came to me and asked me. I never thought mm. of being a journalist, even though my father was one. Uh, I n never intended to do this, but I'm incredibly lucky to work for a newspaper whose core values I share, uh, which is widely respected, and which, and this is remarkable, has never, never censored anything I've written, even when it was against, and it was on some points. I mean, there was a long period when the FT was very keen yeah. that Britain should join the Euro. I was uh, previous editor. I thought this was crazy, though I understood why, and they never stopped me writing leader uh, columns, and I was the main economics commentator attacking implicitly the leader line of the newspaper. There are very few newspapers, certainly in the English-speaking world, that would allow their principal columnists right. to attack the leader line of the paper. So I respect that, and I like it, and so that's why I'm there. British liberalism at its best. Well, I guess now it's a good time to turn the conversation over to the Financial Times, and it more broadly, uh, the news industry. Now, the Financial Times is a private business, and the market for news in which uh, you compete in is changing rapidly. The news media is struggling to compete with the rise of social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and even digital platforms such as BuzzFeed and Huffington Post have had to lay off thousands of employees. Can we say that conventional news sources such as the Financial Times are an endangered species nowadays? I think the answer for the FT is probably no, but I think it's important to understand why the answer is no why and what the problem is, so I will, I will tell you. So, um, the digital revolution in all its various has had a, uh, two effects, which are rather different, but they come together. The first and most obvious is uh, that most of the advertising revenue that used to go to news media, local, national, have now gone to the digital companies. Mm. And you can see this in a very, very simple way. A lot of newspapers, uh, I'll explain why the FT is different, really relied to a very remarkable extent on classified advertising. Mm. The New York Times, for example, great, West American news relied on classified, uh, most local newspapers really relied on classified advertising. Well, nobody does classified advertising in any category in a newspaper anymore. That's what the <laughs> internet, as it were, was designed yeah. for. And of course, a lot of display advertising now, also that used to appear in newspapers, also can be put up into into the web, uh, linked with Google searches and all the rest of it. So the ad revenue, I can't remember the exact figures, but some immense proportion of all digital ad revenues acc accrue to two companies, mm. right? This is and that used to be distributed around the news media. So you've lost your revenue base. We used to have, I, this, is a, this is not perfect memory, but 80% of our revenue was advertising. Oh. And not all of that's gone, but most of it's gone. Um, we didn't. Ch we charge enough from s from newspapers to uh, to just cover the cost of the newsprint. Nothing else. So basic readers were getting the the news gathering free. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, of course, is that we used to benefit from, as it were, the limitations of circulation to 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 get news stories of some kind out to a wide public. You basically you had to be in television, and these were monopolies or quasi-monopolies, uh, or newsprint. And newsprint is a very expensive thing to do, and for most people, for most organizations, to cover news, the world with news, newsprint of your product mm. is impossible, even cover a country. So you get a limited number of titles, and in fact, there were a lot of local monopolies. So we were a local monopoly in business publication. Mm. That's gone too, and with that going, um, of course, the possibility of doing incredibly well out of simply manufacturing news wholesale. There's nothing to stop it, uh, so you get uh, um, all sorts of uh, news organizations appearing, 
which are more or less making it all up. Right. Okay, they, and their readers are quite happy with that because it's telling them what they want to, uh, uh, um, want to hear. So that environment is absolutely different. For general newspapers that have no marked product difference from one another, providing more or less general news, this is sort of mortal. This is really difficult to handle because the only alternative model to the old model is subscription of some kind. And if you're providing something that lots of other people are providing free or quasi-free, and it, what's, how much no, can you no. charge? So you have to be a really good general paper. The New York Times might be good enough with a big enough base and a, to go. But for most general papers, the Washington Post, would, which is a, was a great paper, wouldn't survive without Jeff Bezos' money behind it. It's not a business anymore. There isn't a basis for general newspapers to survive. We have an advantage, which has so far been enough, and it's, which is there are very few business news organizations like ours. In the English language world, there is really only one other than Wall Street Journal. The English language world is obviously the biggest right. in this regard, if you leave aside China, which is sui generis. Um, for business readers, trust is very important because they make decisions based on what they read. So they do care about reliability and they care therefore about reputation. So brand has value and as long as you don't destroy it, that's a very valuable asset. And they will pay because it's a business right. tool and it's a tax deductible, all sorts of lovely things like that. So we now have more subscribers. We have over a million subscribers. We never had anything close to that many readers uh, in our history. So we think that the subscription model with a, and then we now have a new owner with Japanese, which is a very long-term view of these things, the subscription model is viable for us, at least at the moment, but it's not easy, but it is viable. But because we are a niche, and it's the niche that, that is the character, but of course there's a downside. We charge, so lots of people who can't afford it don't get yeah. us. Uh, we have to charge. There's no other way of you doing think this. this. Is problematic, though. It is well. Then that leads to the final point I would make, which is the social consequences yes. of all this. Mm -hmm. The social. So I have a very simple proposition. I'm doing a book at the moment on the crisis of democratic capitalism. So if you look at the history of Western democracy, uh, representative politics in its modern guise, universal suffrage, it rose with the newspaper. The printing press was clearly essential for any form of democracy that covered a large area rather than a city-state. But the printing press in a very specific form, the newspaper, daily news. Without newspapers, you couldn't have had the development in the 19th and early 20th century of democratic institutions. Without reliable news on po relevant, politically relevant things, which bring people together in some way in a common understanding of what is going on in the world, not of values, but of what's going on, which was provided first with the newspapers and then the TV monopolies, some like the BBC, the radio TV monopolies. Without that, it's not clear that democracy as we know it can survive because there isn't a shared story, even vaguely a shared story mm -hmm. on so many topics. So how do you actually have a debate? Democracy is informed debate. Without uh, some form of informed public, you can't have it. So I think the question of what this means for th the collapse of the well-funded newsprint organizations and the fragmentation of TV, Fox TV, and the rest of it, I think is mortal, potentially, for uh, our political systems. Um, and you see that in different kinds. Now, there are lots of other reasons why we're getting all the rise of populist anti-elite parties, and all the rest, there are lots of other reasons, perfectly good ones, but this is one of them. So the FT's solution is not generalizable. It's unique mm. for us. And, uh, and uh, if you look at the other papers in Britain, which has a long tradition of pa newspaper reading, unlike, say, France, um, all the quality papers are in significant trouble. They vary, but they're all in significant trouble. Yeah. Um, in our economic textbooks, the role of, of financial information for, for economic stability comes quite clear. 
where do you think the role lies for financial information and democratic stability outside of, of, of fake news? Is there, is there one outside of fake news? Yeah, well, this gets to a very interesting question to which I don't know the answer, which is, come back to why, why I studied economics. A very large num proportion of the important decisions made by policymakers are economic. No. Okay? Is economic. Um, now, how do voters judge those decisions? Well, there are two ways. The most important way is by how it affects their daily lives. And so the most obvious reasons why public voters in many countries are disgusted with policymakers is they don't feel their daily lives are working no. very well. This has nothing to do with the news. It's a perfectly reasonable conclusion that we trusted you guys to know what you're doing and you don't, no. do you? No. So <laughs> that's a bigger story. But the second way is that they are given information by sources they trust, uh, perhaps by politicians they trust, have reason to trust, but also by news organizations they trust. And if those news organizations disappear or simply don't have the resources to do any sort of job of reporting because it's expensive, no. uh, you know, uh, opinion is cheap, facts are expensive no. is the famous, is the British line on this. Uh, facts are expensive. So if that's not there, then um, they're going to try and get their information from somewhere else. You know, if, if you don't trust the politicians, and you don't trust the news media, the result is not that you don't trust anybody. You will trust somebody. It's just the somebody might be someone I don't like very yeah. much, like Donald Trump. Yeah. Now, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, and you have European equivalents. I won't list them all. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> so the, so uh, the, even in the Netherlands. Uh, now, even here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know how this is contained. I'm very concerned, uh, so move completely from economics. I've been fascinated by the rise of the anti-vaccination movement. Well, okay. Why? Where did that come from? What, how do you interpret that? Uh, I mean, it's obvious I would start from the position that it's completely mad and it Im yeah. incredibly irresponsible, yeah. unbelievably. Ir I have a tiny grandchild and it actually worries me. I mean tiny, I mean four days old. So the... Congratulations. Uh, yeah. That's my fourth, so we're going through a lot of... <laughs> it's, I'm getting used to it. And more on the way. So <laughs> that's not the point. But the point is, this is a social movement that comes out of a total collapse of trust in, 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 in this case, mm. perfectly reputable authority in the sense of the medical profession at its most successful. Well, if that can happen, anything can happen. So any form of nonsense can emerge, like Donald Trump saying to the American people, you know, the Chinese are paying all these tariffs. Yes, the prices mm. are higher than they ever used to be before, but <laughs> it's nothing to do with the tariff. The China and Obviously, half of the American public believe this. So if that is what's going on, how do you have a serious discussion of anything in democratic politics? How can you have democratic politics without some basis, as I said, of a shared up view of the world, uh, uh, the possibility of forming consensus which is based on knowledge to some degree? I'm not, I, I'm not terribly naive. I do understand the history has always been vigorous and violent, so forth, but I do think that the, the combination of elite failure with collapse of trust in media and the rise of lie machines, quite uh, simply, is very, very concerning. And I don't think we know what to do about it. Uh, I would now like to turn to the audience to see if there is still an audience question somewhere. I have one audience question here, Mr. with his hand up. Okay, so you, m you mentioned before the importance that uh, uh, media outlets uh, specialized and uh, not specialized have for uh, modern democracies. And um, a series of uh, episodes uh, came to my mind. Uh, for, uh, for instance, uh, in my, my own country, my home country, we have uh, this kind of problem that uh, uh, often uh, 
when uh, uh, political candidates and um, experts, even though often they are far from being experts, uh, when interview, they don't have any kind of uh, like uh, counterfactual. For example, I seen a recent interview on uh, one of the main uh, TV channels uh, where there was this guy saying that uh, public debt uh, is some kind of uh, symbol of uh, a country being rich, which is totally insane. Symbol of what? Uh, yeah, basically, according to this guy, the more public debt you have, uh, the richer you are. And uh, there was the uh, interviewer, which was like just, yeah, that's it. So uh, my question is, uh, would you say that uh, we are uh, und underestimating the adverse effects uh, that uh, lack of uh, economic preparations on uh, of uh, journalists working in uh, general news uh, outlets uh, may have. What country is yours, if I may ask? Italy. <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> I thought this was going to be the event, but I wasn't going to talk about uh, uh, Italy. Um, so um, the media have always been under-resourced. They're quite, sm one of the things that most people don't realize is that the media are really quite small organizations. If you add the major media together, the number of people employed is really qu quite modest. Uh, we have a, a, you know, this is a, just a little example, but there are, I can't remember, I think an order of magnitude at least, maybe two orders of magnitude, more people in the city of London in public relations than there are people working at the Financial Times. Uh, uh, so the point is, uh, these organizations are quite small. And they hire journalists because they're good journalists, which means they can write a story, they know what a story looks like and so forth. Uh, economists, economically trained people are generally very, very bad at this. Uh, so, the, this is, there's a story about this. So the result is that most media outlets in the world, including very famous ones like the BBC, so the BBC is still, I would think, a relatively respectable public news. It has virtually no trained economists on the staff at all. It does have some, but it is an incredibly tiny number and I presume it's worse elsewhere, possibly even in Italy. Um, the, so, that's, so that is a fundamental problem. Um, the story I was going to tell, which is relevant in a way, and it explains quite a lot, w is the difference between economic journalists in America and Britain, and particularly in our case. So most journalists covering economic beats, not all, but pretty well all, covering economic beats in America are not ge economists. They've gone through a graduate training in journalism, uh, usually one of the famous journalist schools in America, like Columbia. These are good schools, and they teach them a lot of important ethical principles about stories. But they don't give them any specialized knowledge of economics. So they tend to do find say, let's find an expert on the left and an expert on the right, and I'll quote them both, and then the reader can make up his or her mind about what makes sense. The reason they do this is that they take it for granted that anyone who's done a PhD in economics is borderline illiterate and incapable of producing a worthwhile sentence, obviously in this case in English. Uh, uh, and by the way, they're right, mostly. Not <laughs> always. <laughs> there are some very distinguished <coughs> economists in America. Paul Krugman is obviously the most famous, who can write pretty damn well. But they are rare. They used to be more common in the older days. The greatest economic journalist of the 20th century in the English language, and this is an interesting, the greatest economic journalist in the English language in the 20th century was John Maynard Keynes. It is unthinkable that you could say this of any modern economist, professional economist, at least. Pa though Paul Samuelson and Milton Friedman, interestingly, completely divergent, were both very good writers, but that's a generation ago. So the British are better off because we still educate people at school and university to write our mother tongue. 
uh, we still rather like English. And the only thing that in the moment I feel is good about Britain on. And the result is, at the FT, we just hire people with economics degrees, including PhDs. And we take it for granted they can write, and they can. So when we have economic writing in the FT, it's mostly, not all, done by economists. People who have at least a professional background. And that's a big problem. So the answer to you, and I've thought this about this a lot, may be relevant to this audience. Um, we need to get more people with economics backgrounds into journalism. But of course the school, they have to have the qualities needed to write and communicate and in their language, whatever it is, and, the, and the, the media or outlets have to want to hire them because they think people will want to listen to them. At the moment, I would say in most organizations that's no longer workable. And there are some very famous British newspapers, again the generalist problem, which used to have really first-rate economic colonists doing things like me, and basically they've all given it up. Why have they given it up? Nobody wants to read it, because it's too difficult. And they want newspapers to be entertaining and fun, and economics, I have to admit, <laughs> is mostly not entertaining and fun, though it is important. And so public knowledge collapses and we end up with the Brexit nonsense. This is a, Brexit is the product of, of, a, of a country which is economically comprehensively illiterate. That's obviously a failure of the media comprehensively. You couldn't get a better example of a failure of the media. Mm. I don't know what we do about this. And the BBC, by the way, failed too because they were frightened of taking a position saying, well, that position from the Brexiters is complete nonsense. They were just too frightened to say that. And so they treated lunatics as equivalent to professionals, even though 95% of serious British economists were against Brexit. The 5% who were for Brexit were all taken terribly seriously because they had to have the other voice. And that's a final problem. This desperate need for uh, respectable outlets for quote-unquote balance, even if the balance is between the completely insane and the sensible. Mm. <laughs> well, th <laughs> thank you for the uh, audience question. We will have uh, opportunity for a question later on. <laughs> um, but now we'd like to turn to your writings, Mr. Wolf, the ones you've written about, and you write al about a lot of topics. So we would like to focus on two, uh, starting off with climate change. Now, you have frequently written in your articles on climate change that it is no longer a technical problem necessarily, but more of a political one. Specifically, you've called it, a, you've called it politically painful. Why would you call climate change politically painful? Um, so there are, there are probably two ways of thinking about that. Um, the first is that even if you believe, and this is a debate I'm not sure about. So there's a huge debate out there between serious people, uh, I can give lots of lames mm. obviously, who would say we can adjust to having a growing economy which is carbon neutral. And if environmentally sound. And there are other people who I think have to be taken pretty seriously who would say actually it's impossible. And if we want a carbon neutral and environmentally sound economy, growth has to stop. Mm. Okay. For the moment, let's focus on the former view, which is sort of the dominant view on the economically active climate space. So if you take the two most obvious experts, Jeff Sachs and Nick Stern, they would both be in the former camp. Okay? In which camp are you? The, I'm going to come to that okay. in a moment. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll come to them. So I'd assume that you've got the optimistic view. So this is an optimistic view. We can continue to m grow, but it will be different. But it will be very different. It implies an immense structural, an unknown series of structural upheavals in a very short time. By a very short time, I mean, I mean the next 30 years, and a lot of it now. Is this similar to the Green New Deal? And uh, that will be part of it, yeah. that sort of thing. Well, it will be a mixture of radical changes in incentives with radical changes in planning structures. I wrote a column about this, mm. and a lot of different investments. 
So it's a huge upheaval. People are frightened of upheavals. People think they will suffer in upheavals. People aren't quite conservative, particularly in relatively old societies. Young people are usually more gung-ho about change, which is why, of course, they, because they can see there's lots of benefits in change. One of them is you can get rid of all these old people because they're irrelevant in a changing world. So I can see this. Historically, all revolutions come from relatively young people. Um, but we are a very old society, so young people's w political weight in the West, America, Britain, pretty more small. The center of gravity is around the age of 50. They don't want these changes. They think they're frightening, and they're going to vote against them. And if that means s accepting the principle that actually climate change is not a threat, they're going to accept that, and they'll vote for Mr. Trump. Mm. And, uh, and that will be it. So that's the upheaval thing. Uh, and the upheaval is a really frightening thing. Then, of course, if you believe the second view, um, then it gets much scarier. Uh, so th I think of this in the following way. That I must explain why it's really good. Let us assume that we believed. I'm not saying I do believe, yeah. because I hope it's not true. That we couldn't really manage our environmental impact broadly defined, not just climate, the biosphere, extinction, without basically stopping the growth process. Mm. And let's assume that's the case. What does it mean for you and us? Well, right now, the world GDP per head average, it, PPP, is uh, probably a little under $10,000. I don't know the exact figure, it's roughly mm. that. So the GDP per head in the Netherlands is about four and a half times that. In the UK, four times. Mm. In America, it's five times that. And of course, the GDP per head in Africa is a tenth of that or less. It should go down to the Congo where it's 4% of that. Mm. Okay. You can't sus possibly imagine you can sustain a world in which there's no aggregate growth with fossilized like this, with inequalities on that scale. It will be impossible. The only w world in which that could happen will be monstrously coercive uh, and brutal. I mean, just monstrous, because you're basically saying to the developing world, you're incredibly poor and you can't get any richer, mm. ever. And we're going to make sure you don't. Well, think about that. So. What you would have to do if you wanted any sort of ethical world is to divide the GDP per head more evenly. I don't say perfectly, but divide it somewhat less unevenly. In a zero growth world, it would probably be reasonable to expect consumption standards, living standards in the Netherlands to be reasonable to fall by 75%. Yeah. You try and get elected on no, that proposition. Yeah. So <laughs> the zero growth view is politically, and then nobody on that side is honest about it. It cannot be done in any feasible democracy, any conceivable one. You're completely delusional if you think otherwise. Um, so this is a so, problem. So the result is you are sort of forced, again, it might be my illusion to believing in Jeff and Nick yeah. know what they're talking about. And even then, you've got the, cre the, the terror. So the, the political story has to be Policymakers have to make the transformation, structural transformation, look appealing. They have to recognize people's fear of the structural transformation, and they have to sell the idea that we can do this without losing everything that we've accumulated the, the way we live now. Um, uh, and that's a hell of a sale. And nobody, no political leader, even the ones who recognize there's a problem, have actually been willing and able to sell that story convincingly, and above all, they haven't sold it in any of the big countries of the world, above all the US and China. You want to talk about China? Well, that's where the change would have to be. We are not the story anymore. The growth of emissions all comes somewhere else. So this is politically, whatever you believe, a staggering nightmare, and we haven't fixed it. And that's why I've written this many, many, many times. We spent 40 years talking about climate change, and um, the change we've c uh, actually implemented so far is nothing. Nothing important has changed. Carbon emissions continue to rise. 
aggregate to write com carbon emissions per head tend to rise, continue though less so, um, and we are just talking a lot and nothing has happened. Now you mentioned China already. You say that okay, we are not of importance anymore. We need to look to the east. Well, for the c for China is far and away the biggest emitter in the world. Yeah. So if if chi uh, China doesn't but stop the that, then we're not going to do much about climate change. But the revolution in, in in sustainable energy in that sense, from a technological point of view, also comes from China. That is correct. Um, now you already mentioned in democracy, uh, zero growth is 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 not feasible. We can't do that. Um, and w when we look at China, they of course don't have a democracy. Still, we s perceive China as a threat rather than as a as a part of the solution. Do you think that this characterization of China as a threat is is valuable? Is is, is it holds true? Well, there's several different questions there. So, Let's do the last so one. the <laughs> well, just on the the climate one, uh, the Chinese government is pretty clear. They recognize it's a problem. Yeah. They are actually led by scientists, you know, which is quite a good thing, uh, uh, but they may not be a democracy, but they sure know that the Chinese people expect higher living standards. In fact, the Chinese people would rather like to live like Westerners, mm. and there's no chance they're going to prevent this. Uh, you can't spend a lot of time being in China without realizing that. Now, they would like to do this while making climate compatible, but they've only really stopped, said that they're going to stop uh, rising emissions rapidly rising emissions by 2030. So it's very gradual. And they still burn an awful lot of mm. coal. Um, so even in China, getting action, given the growth they want, they want to triple the size of their economy in the next 30 years. That's sort of a pretty big deal. And I'm being optimistic. Um, more broadly, my view is very simple. And I've been absolutely opposed, and I've been clear about this, to the current Western campaign, and particularly the American campaign, to vilify, to start a new Cold War. Right. I mean, clearly the, the thrust of American policy now is moving towards a new Cold War, and we're lucky if it stays cold, uh, with China. Right. And the tariff trade war we're seeing is part of that, I think. Um, and it reflects a gathering paranoia about the rise of China. Uh, and that has two, dis perhaps three distinct elements. The one is the realization that if China and later India continue to expand, as they are likely to do, the West dominance of the world, domination of the world and the in general, and the US domination of the world in particular, will be over. And my answer to that is you're 4% of humanity of the, or the US, the developed West is 12% of humanity. The idea that we're going to run the whole world forever is ludicrous, get over it. Yeah. But anyway, that's, people hate this idea yeah. that we won't run the world. Secondly, there is a genuine and perfectly understandable dislike. Uh, I don't think revulsion is quite right, but dislike, and in some ways very intense dislike of the way the Chinese system operates. Mm politically, and some of it, the Uyghurs, for example, is a huge moral dilemma. Um, but my view is that's for the Chinese to sort out. Yeah. It's not for us to sort out. We have our moral standards. I wish we lived by them rather better than we do, but uh, that's our problem. Uh, we've done so many terrible things. The Chinese have to sort this out. And this then leads to me to the third point. They think we cannot live with these people, and there must therefore be a conflict. My view is the exact office, opposite, which is that we must live with these people, there is no alternative, and therefore we must find ways of cooperating. I believe that economically, politically, geopolitically, this is perfectly possible, because actually the Chinese objectives are pretty obvious, and not fantastically threatening. I don't think the Chinese intend to turn the whole world into their empire. I think they've got quite enough problems on their own already. I think they want to get more prosperous. Well, why not? Uh, I think they want to work out a way, a modus vivendi with us. Of course, they want to be more powerful. There's no doubt about it. They want to work out a modus vivendi because stability allows them to develop, and that's their biggest objective. Uh, so if we can get over our post-hegemonic uh, terror, we can work this out. That's my, those are my positions. Yeah. Do I think any of that's going to happen in a sensible way? No, I'm absolutely sure it won't. And I'm very, very worried that we are moving towards 
uh, a significant conflict, and I think Europe has absolutely no idea where it stands in this, and, uh, uh, but I think and fear that Europe will in the end be driven into the American corner, and we will end up with a ribbon world, uh, a separation of economies, and some version of a disentangled e economic system, which will also be a geopolitical system. Mm. Uh, I'm not at all sure that in the long run, to put it mildly, we're going to win that. Mm. A lot of countries around the world, a, a lot of countries around the world are going to end up in the Chinese corner. Um, but it will be a mess. But is this fear because of the current administration under Trump, who is very... I don't think it's... Trump is extreme yeah. on many fronts. What has concerned me most and surprised me somewhat, depressed me a great deal, is that his view of China is one of the few really bipartisan views. Now, of course, on the Democratic side, there are people who are worried about China more for human rights reasons. Mm. There are people who are more concerned purely about trade and competition, less about geopolitical issues. They disagree with Trump on climate. But the, if you look at the long list, and I can give you a long list, but you don't have time, <laughs> uh, of different groups in America who have become very, very hostile to China, including business community, which is also happening here, then it's really bipartisan. And a lot of them are more extreme than Mr. Trump, who rather, as he competes on saying, I love Mr. Xi. Uh, that's because he would like to be Mr. Xi. The, 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 uh, the point is, I think it's a bipartisan. This is very interesting. I lived through the whole Cold War. Mm. That was a big challenge of my childhood and youth and adult life. Um, and I was pretty clear that the Soviet Union was not a country we could live with comfortably, and I was very happy when it collapsed. Uh, but I think to, to paint modern China as the Soviet Union reborn, even with Xi's polit politics, which I dislike, is, I think, a very, very profound mistake. And in any case, China is not going to go away, I mean, pretty obviously. So um, I think this direction, which is bipartisan, will survive Trump. It may be more rational, but it might not have been so wildly different in many respects if Hillary Clinton had been president. Uh, so I'm not clear that we should focus here on Trump. Now, if Clinton had been there, she would be forcing the Europeans to go with on the American side against China, and she would probably have done quite well. Trump doesn't care about that. He wants to break up the West. But I think the thrust towards a breakdown in relations between the West and China is very powerful and potentially very destabilizing. Uh, I'd like to turn to the audience again for an audience question. Mr. over there with his hand up, could you stand up? Yeah. I should do a short answer. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, you mentioned two obstacles to democratic capitalism. On the one hand, the difficulties that economists have in communicating economics to the citizens, and on the other hand, the difficulties that citizens have in understanding economics. Now, a year ago, we had Ha Jun Chung here, and he extended another factor, and that is since the 1980s, the dominant school in economics has worked hard to make it appear as kind of a quasi-subfield of physics. A lot of emphasis on mathematics and on modeling, and that this also crowds out citizens from participating in the debate on economics. And uh, I would like to hear your view on it. Well, I agree with that, uh, but then I've never been one of them. Um, and a lot of the, f the near mathematics, near phys you know, so the physical, mathematical economics turned out to be completely useless anyway. So, uh, uh, um, so I think if you're asking me the question, am I happy with where economics has gone in the last 40 years? My answer is no. Uh, I think the discipline has gone wrong. It is to make it mathematically tractable. They have encoded some extraordinarily lu ludicrous simplifying assumptions, which aren't true. Uh, and that has very profound effects. For example, within canonical economics, money doesn't exist. That was just ridiculous. Uh, 
monetary institutions are core institutions of developing country, uh, developing economies. Um, so I won't go into all that. So, so then that raises a very profound question, what is the future of economics as a subject within uh, our modern societies? Um, that's an epistemological question of a quite profound nature. There might be two answers to this, I think. Uh, I don't think it's going to be possible to reform economics as it is now. So we might have to have two disciplines. And, uh, and, uh, and some of that already exists. A lot of it in Britain in the geography department. A lot of it rubbish, but not all. Um, but I think there's a very profound question, which we don't have the answer, which is if you have a social science, which is therefore embedded in the reality of social life, which we make and we understand. It's obviously a completely different science from physics, which is a description of the natural world, which allows us to manipulate the natural world, but it doesn't change the nature of the natural world. Economics does. It shapes the nature of the natural world, uh, the, the human world, the social world. So the effort to turn economics into a branch of physics is a profound mistake in my view. I think this much more clearly than I did 10 years ago. Um, and economics should recognize that it's just part of the understanding of, econ of human society and should be very, very closely related to the other sciences that study human society like anthropology, sociology, and psychology. This is just something s economists find too scary for words. Um, uh, and I don't know where we go from here. I had the great advantage that I learned economics pretty well before any of this had happened, and I've been fairly immune to what have come along since. I understand broadly what the ideas are. Um, uh, but I'm pretty sure now that if I were an equivalent person to myself uh, 50 years ago, at 20, um, I wouldn't have done economics at all. And I think that, because it wouldn't, wouldn't interest me. So I think this is uh, a subject which made an incredibly big mistake in, in the way it thought about itself and its social role, its political role. It's a mistake that people like Adam Smith or John Maynard Keynes would never have made. And I don't know whether it can be saved. I really don't. All right, thank you for that audience question. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So Mr. Wolf, to end off, you've already hinted at this, but from our understanding, we know you are currently writing a new book. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's titled Elites Versus the People, Rise of Populism and the Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. Could you give us a short synopsis of your upcoming book? <laughs> <laughs> it, that is a very good title, but it's not the title I'm oh, using. Oh, it's not the title. No, no, okay. no, <laughs> it's a I had a title on that. No, it's a, it's, uh, my working title was Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, but I like Elites Versus the People. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the story... <laughs> So very, very simply, how do you, I think democracy has a, I'll just, I'll take the, a very simple core of it, but it, there's so much more, but this is the question. Um, I believe democracies were the product of the emergence of dynamic market economies with a lot of government support mm -hmm. in the 19th century. There is a very profound relationship between market-oriented economies and democracy. I think they are naturally symbiotic. There's got a lot about that. They are also, that's the one side. Mm -hmm. The other side, they are also quite obviously mutually destructive. Um, you've got essentially an economic system and a political system whose premises are the same in the sense that people matter, but in completely different in their view of equality. In essence, that's one way of thinking about it. The underlying logic of democratic politics should be egalitarian, and the underlying logic of a market econo economic system obviously isn't. And when these two, that stress caused by these divergences within the nation, 
the sp among citizens, the, if the inequalities get too large, this symbiosis collapses. And it ends up either it, with the charismatic leader of the people, the populist rabble-rouser, or plutocracy, or possibly both. And this has happened many, many times in the past, but since there are far more democracies now than ever before, I won't go to discuss whether representative versus direct mm -hmm. democracy. The tension is occurring on a much wider range of countries than before. That's our crisis. And the crisis is quite general. It's quite clear that there's a what Larry Diamond calls a democratic recession across the world, but particularly in the developed world. So that's the analysis. So the book will tell you how we're going to fix it. When can we expect it? Uh, I'm going to try and finish writing it at the end of the, the end of this summer. I write my books in the summer. It's turned out to be much more interesting than I ever imagined. And, the <laughs> uh, and it was interesting. Yeah. But there is one interesting thing. This idea that of the relationship between democracy and equality among the citizens. The first person to express that idea perfectly in one paragraph is, of course, Aristotle. Mm. And the first person who argued, and this is interesting given it, that if democracy doesn't work, you end up with a tyrant who puts himself forward as the protector of the people, was Plato. Mm. So, so the, the, the great anti-democrat, the interesting <laughs> thing is, this fundamental dilemmas, this is where classics come away, the, the fundamental dilemmas were clearly understood by the great Greek philosophers, and though the, our societies, our economies, our political systems have changed, they're essentially the same. By the way, the Athenians never worked how to, fi out how to fix oh. this. So the assumption that it might not be fixable is not unreasonable. Well, thank you, Mr. Wolf. We are more than happy to have you back on our stage when the book is published to discuss <laughs> it. But we have some upcoming interviews uh, in the next month. In June, we will be hosting Harold Godin, the CEO of TomTom, Tom, on our stage. So please join us in June for our next interview. But in the meantime, please give a round warm of applause for our guest, Martin Wolf. <laughs>